out. So I recorded. Oh, we're recording. There you go. Oh, there you go. All right. I see. I'm about it. to explain to you why I'm afraid to uh, record to the cloud, and it doesn't matter because we're recording to my computer. It says recording on your screen or mine. Howdy. Howdy. So, Marty, I met you last Saturday at a jam session, and it was so much fun. I, I mean this. This is not false humility. I felt like I. I felt like I was in Wayne's world, like uh, we're not worthy kind of thing. But I, I got, <laughs> I got there, and I was the last one there. It was a socially distanced outdoor jam. It was about 135 degrees outside. Yeah, we were definitely distanced, very distant. And I pull up, and I think, oh, I guess they're just playing some music, piping some music through a PA system. You know, like it sounded just like you know, like an album or the radio, not the radio anymore. And then as I get out of my car, I'm like, fuck, I'm not worthy. <laughs> you guys, I, don't, I don't remember what you guys were playing, but it sounded really good. You had that young guy in guitar. He was like 25 and that kid yes, on keyboard. That's right. Yeah. Those, and those kids were good. That's it. They were really good. And um, we had, I think, in total five guitar players eventually once yeah. I started trying. At any point in time, we had five guitar players at once, which is really yeah. hard to do. Yeah. And that's you good. were doing percussion. In yes. the beginning, like, yes. regu- like non drum set percussion. I mean, a, right. a mini kind of set. Yes. And, and what really, what I thought, there were a couple of things that I thought were cool, and I'm like, I can't wait to learn a little more about you and your professional history. So I'm a non professional musician. I'm like just like a garage band, college hacker kind of guy, and I love it. So I'm watching you doing this thing with some percussive whatever. And there was, some, what was that? Thing? Oh, the shaker? Okay, shaking, yeah. shaking the shape. And um, there was, you looked professional the way you were doing it. I thought this guy's probably like, <laughs> it, seriously, it sounded good. But here's the moment that got me. So everyone starts playing Bad by You Too, which is my favorite song in the world. Oh, yeah. It's a great there song. There's two, so, there's two basic chords you play around in it. I remembered one of the two. <laughs> so. So I just sort of put my volume low and I'm kind of playing around and just sort of playing it, but not well. And and with four other guitar players, it was easy enough to not screw up the song. But what I thought was really, really cool, and I mean this with all sincerity, I remember you switched over from your little percussion station, because at that point, there were two drum kits and no one was playing drums yet. You moved over onto the drums and the way you filled the sound space was really special. I mean, it was really special. Thanks, thanks. Well, and, and I, I thought this guy is special on the drums. Like, and, and be, for me, because I was just sort of very quietly doing sort of, I thought I had the chords right. I was mixed so low that I could barely hear myself. So instead, I allowed myself to just get enveloped by the music. I mean, you've got all those guitar players, and the, the kid had a, the perfect echo. He was doing a nice version of Edge. And your drums, whatever you did, it was so musical. You weren't just keeping a regular beat. But you were, I think, very focused on the tonality of the kit you were on. Am I right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I was actually inspired by his guitar part. because Really? So, it was so uh, mystifying. Yeah. He, he really pulled it off. He did. He did. It was really good. I just... I just I just went with him. Basically. Oh, really? That's interesting. Oh, it was, yeah. Because you were, I mean, I could sort of hear it in my head, but you were working all the drums, and, and I could tell that you were so much more than keeping the beat or even, you know, dare I say, you know, like advancing the rhythm. It was much It was much more three-dimensional than that, and I, I took note of it. Oh, thanks. Very cool. that was, that's very observant of you. That makes you the better musician also, David. I have to uh, say. It was, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, you know, and I remember I didn't have a guitar strap with me. So I'm just sitting <laughs> on my amp, you know. And so it really allowed me to sort of be, even though I was participating in the song, I was really a fly on the wall. And um, just I, I, I enjoyed it almost as much as a spectator, as a participant in that song. It was very cool. That moment was definitely a highlight for yeah, me. Yeah, wasn't it? It was. It was. Oh, it was cool. just something that was a spur of the moment. And some sometimes those... Those are the moments that are, are most, most worthwhile. Yeah. And, and the other one we did that was fun, we were, because I play so few things, I was just so, doing some kind of progression in ninths. We did the kind of a funky thing. 
Oh. There were a few times the groove kind of got, you know, I thought nice, and I was leaning on the better guitar players to do their part, but it was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some, there's some magical moments, and then the alcohol sometimes kicks in, and either it yeah. gets better or it doesn't. Right, that's right. You think you sound better, but you don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like the great idea that you write down and you wake up the next morning like, oh, that wasn't very good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, Paul Simon had always uh, do rehearsals and he would break down a song. Right. Piece by piece. And we would work on that one song. Okay. Just for that one day. And it'd be like, that'd be the rehearsal. And then we'd come in the next day and he'd do something totally different. Wait, wait, so now that is an amazing segue. What's so cool about this interview, and one of the reasons why I was looking forward to it so much, I don't know shit about you. <laughs> like, I don't know anything. So now you just referenced Paul Simon. So that could be you were in a cover band learning a Paul Simon song, or it could mean that you were with Paul Simon learning a Paul Simon song. Either one, either one is interesting to me. Actually, I, I, I've never played with Paul Simon, but I've, I've been on in and out of his crew for like over 20 years. Oh, really? Yeah. So, now, I've, so I've, done every, I've done every position, uh, including taking care of Paul for a second. So, oh, really? So, yeah. so here's what, so th this is a great segue because, you know, I, I have a little cut and paste of your, your resume as you would find it either on Facebook and a little bit on LinkedIn and things like that. And I know that you are a musician. I know that firsthand and just, you know, from looking at you but on your page, that is. But I also know you're a tech. And I said to you before we started today, I don't want to learn exactly what that is yet because I'd rather learn it on our show. Um, so let's, let's use the, the Paul Simon situation as, a, as an example. So for 20 years, what have you done with Paul? What, what does it mean? Well, uh technicians or some guys like to call it consultants <laughs> okay right what the, what the common phrase is pretty much a roadie okay uh, you know so you, you either take care of guitars pianos keyboards whatever you're assigned to or whatever your specialty is uh whatever your skill set is uh you you handle so um i've been pretty versed in a lot of the different departments so I, I gives me a chance to work a lot, and in Paul's camp, it it intermingles with uh, uh, all the different departments. So he, uh, for example, uh, when I first started on Paul, I was the, the percussion tech. Okay. I would take care of. I had three stations I had to take care of, set up three percussion setups, and uh, that was it. So would you have to tune the kits and everything, like, or would the drummers themselves want to do that? Uh, it varied. Some guys would let me do it. Some guys wouldn't. Okay. Back, then, back in early uh, stages, I wasn't that uh, well versed in uh, percussion world, so right. I did that much tuning to do. Usually, you're tuning congas and bongos or timbales, uh, but like you know, you're not tuning any shakers or anything like that. It's mostly just placement and making sure everything works and do you, would you mic them or is that somebody else that's somebody else okay but, uh i've i've grown into that position also okay sometimes uh you need to uh help out so right right i remember eddie tested said uh it's about uh being able to work with other people and that, right that, yeah I, I live i live for that yeah I, isn't it I, true I, it is it's sometimes not not the best uh, players that make it in, but it's the guys right. that you want to uh, hang out with. It, it's true. And, and you know, we, we talked about it on that show that it translates into everything in life. It does. You know, it the does. people you who, who who emote positivity are the people we all gravitate toward. We don't gravitate toward toxic people, even if they're talented. Right, right, right. But for example, uh, a prime example is I know, and I can't mention any names, but a, an artist did all auditions for drummers. Okay. And it came down to it: one guy who was a top-ranked session player nailed it, completely nailed it, and it was perfect for the gig. Uh, 
uh, the artist opted out for someone else of a little bit lower caliber, but still just as good because you realize that you'd rather spend time with that person yeah. on the bus. Well, you know, it's funny. I always like to draw parallels uh, with my legal career, which is what I do in the day. And there are some lawyers who get a lot done by being, and a lot accomplished for their clients by being nice and affable and, and friendly. And I think, all right, that's a life you build for yourself where you wake up in the morning, you look forward to your day, you have a really good day, you make the people around you happy, make yourself happy, and there's all this good stuff. And then I know a lot of lawyers whose entire career is built upon being a raging asshole. And, and I'm not kidding. And they're good. You know, they, they accomplish a lot. I don't think they accomplish anything more than the non-assholes. Right. 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 Um, but, but one could build a career based on being an asshole. Uh, but then you think about it. Then you look back on the last decade of your life. You think, what did I do it for? Right. If, if I do this all day long and I'm, I'm just spewing toxicity and then I'm spreading it like a cancer, you know, yes, I put a few bucks in my pocket. I might have some technical accomplishments, but what have I really accomplished? Right. You know? Right. Well, it does, it, that, that's so true. And uh, one particular woman that I worked for, I've worked over for over, I want to say 30 years. Wow. I can't, I can't say her name, obviously. Ruth uh, Buzzy? Huh? Is it Ruth Buzzy? <laughs> Sorry. It's my favorite non sequitur. That's, that's hilarious. I, I didn't think she had that type of re reputation. She does. She does. It's horrible. Oh my God. Well, I'm, I'm kidding. Ruth. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. She's dead, right? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, let's see over under. <laughs> Sorry. The, the woman well, for thirty years. Well, over thirty years, and uh, we get along. To, for the first couple of years, I would get fired every year. Oh, really? I get rehired. I've, I was, I've literally been hired and rehired, fired and rehired nine times from this artist. Wow. And uh, uh, I'm still working for her, because, but, she, you know, because she's nuts. Right. But off off the stage, we have, we have, like, incredible conversations. It's great. We're nice to each other. But, like, when she's on the stage... The bitch switch is on and just stays wow. on. They pull out the toggle switch. And I, I keep going back because she's uh, an amazing artist. Right. She gives it 110% and the audience loves her, you know, and it's, 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 a, it's an amazing show when she's on. Is she, you think it's that she's nervous that if she doesn't deliver a product that good, that she'll somehow lose her station and then she takes it out on all the people around her. Is it something like that? It's, it's, it's somewhat like that and, and kind of like an insecurity, you know? Right. And I don't even think sometimes it's uh, like how Eddie Testa referenced that, like you need to check your ego at the door. Yeah. Yeah. She kind of like hides it in her, her pocket bag and pulls it out whenever she needs to. Right. And it's not even a thing. Whereas, uh, uh, it's about ego. It's for her. It's about like being heard and making sure that she's getting her point across because she's so insecure. Right. She's a lot of insecurities about herself. She'll she'll dress up like sporadically, and sometimes you you like you see her come out and be like, "What were you thinking of?" Like, right. Really? So you know, it's it's kind of like that. So she's looking not just for the sort of the musical success, but she wants to, to look a certain way. And then sometimes she goes out on a limb and there's an epic fail. And then that feeds right. her insecurity. Right. That feeds her yeah. insecurity. But, you know, she, her voice is so powerful and so uh, she doesn't look at the response of her performance. She looks at, oh, my God, what, a, what did I do wrong? Oh, that's a I shame. It, it is because she's, she's truly an amazing artist. And then that's the sad thing is that the people who watch her are probably getting more enjoyment out of her than she is. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And she, you know, she treats the people around her like crap. And it's just, you know, it's, right. you want to say it's karma, but you know, she's had a long, she's had like over, over 40 years of, uh, of, uh, you know, a career. 
you know, wow. to see, you know, you just never know. But and then the sad thing is, you know, she's, it's like what I just said, so she could look back on the last 40 years, has she had any, has she had joy right. from her career? Right. She might have given out, not to the people in her orbit, she might not have given joy, her audience gets the joy, right? but she's not even getting it herself. That's a right. shame. Yeah, it is. She's not, she, she's always looking forward to uh, moving forward and doing work and stuff like that. And she, she has a son. Okay. She, she's barely raised. Uh, and uh, she, she loves, you can tell she loves because she talks about him all the time, but she, you know that she doesn't spend any time with him. Well, that's a real shame. And it's so many levels. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And, and it's a thing where as like, other artists that I've worked for, we've talked about past experiences and past tours. And with her, we're either talking about family or we're talking about um, uh, upcoming shows. Okay. There's no, there's no real like conversation about like, remember that time in, in uh, Moscow where we played in front of that audience and it rained down or any of that? It's, no reference to that. So she, so when she looks back on her life, she doesn't have fond memories for her entire career. Like in other words, her the, the the centerpiece of what she does has not filled her life with positive memories, I guess, or at least not that she wants to chat about. Right. Exactly, and that's what I think too. And I think she her focus is so much in the future that uh, she 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 can't. You know, she's had a Broadway show. She's working wow. on another Broadway show. So it's it's a it's a it's a big thing for her. Just Dude, it's clear to me we're talking about Ruth Buzzy right now. <laughs> I mean, she's been on Broadway, she, she sings. Sorry if I hurt you with that now that she's oh, no, it's all good. No good. No, yeah. no, no. The mere fact that I I, I doubt it who Ruth Ruth Buzzy is, it's it's yeah. great. Yeah. So, so in 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 your career doing this, um, have you traveled the world? Oh yeah, I would have to say. I'd say the only place I haven't uh, gone to, and I had, <laughs> it's it's a little ironic that I've never been to China. Oh really? The only country you haven't been, because there's not much tours going through China. Right, right. It's like Japan, you know, over, all over the east. Eastern, uh, East Asia and all that, India, e all over the world. That's, wow. I've been very, very lucky. That's really cool. And then, so I would think what, what you're talking about in terms of your relationship with the artists is that there's probably, you know, you, you, they're on for a couple hours, maybe three, but probably more like two. And then there's a ton of downtime, right? Whether you're on a tour bus, an airplane, in a hotel lobby having drinks, is that where you develop your relationships with them? Uh, it depends. It depends. There's there's a lot less downtime than you think. It depends oh, on really? the tour. It depends on the tour. Um, uh, there are some tours where you can have like a, uh, a couple of days off, or you can have in a row, or you can have like every other day off. Uh, back in that day, I remember doing a, a tour with Megadeth, and we did 27 days straight. Wow. And then out of the out of the seven day work week, three of those days were doubles. Radio show in the morning and a regular rock show at night. Oh, so they in other words, they're promoting in the morning on the yeah. radio and then they're doing the show at night. Or like or like a, a radio uh festival. Oh oh festival. okay. Okay. So like that. It could be any of that. It could be any combination of that. So, so who would throw out some names at us? Let's let's hear some of the names of some of the more well-known acts you've toured with. Oh uh, wow. Okay. Uh, uh, Rush. Pink oh Floyd. really? Wait wait I heard I didn't hear the second one. Pink Floyd. Uh, wow. Uh, uh, Tim McGraw, Faith Hill, uh, Tim and Faith, uh, Sting, Seal. Steely Dan. Uh, oh my God, it's all drawing a blank now. Sean Colvin, Mary Chapin Carpenter, J Lo, Public Enemy. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned Paul Simon. Oh, Paul Simon definitely. It's one of the one of the earlier tours. Squeeze. Uh, By the way, 
could they possibly have a, I love Squeeze. Could they be potentially more boring in concert? Oh no, it's, it's a great Squeeze. Is there really? I saw them in the eighties and they just, they were amazing, but they didn't do anything. Are they different now? No, Squeeze is a musician's rock band. Okay, all right. Kind of like Steely Dan, because I've seen that. Oh, absolutely, yes. That's they don't right. do anything. They just play amazingly, yep. but that's it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is. Actually, you know, and we were, that was one of the tours that got canceled this year for me. Oh, really? Yeah. Right, your life is so different now. So oh, yeah. you've got, and I'm, we probably, so that's one, probably about eight or nine bands you mentioned just off the top of your head, and that's probably a partial list, right? Yeah, it is. I, I'm the king of subs. <laughs> now, what does that mean? I, I, I go in when guys want to take a break. Sometimes okay. it's a long tour, and uh, I go in and fill in. Okay. I have to say, like, very few, like, on Pink Floyd, I was a sub. On Rush, I was a sub. Um, Pantera. Uh, Tool. Um, Who? Jewel or Tool? Tool. I don't know that. And Jewel. And oh. Jewel also. Um, a lot of, a lot of different guys. Suzanne Vega. Wow. Uh, a lot of, a lot of different so bands. Are, mo are most texts like you musicians? Uh, there are and there aren't. Okay. You know, and some jobs require that you play. Like I know on Van Halen, the drummer, the drum tech is, is, is supposed to play. Oh, really? Yeah, because sometimes uh, Alex wants to warm up. He gets there late, and he has to. So somebody else has to do the sound check. Oh, that's interesting. All right? Have you ever done that? No. Oh, sound check? Yes, I have. Like sound check where you're behind a drum. Well, you you. So what do you play? You play drums. We know that. What else do you play? Uh, uh, I play percussion, drums, bass, uh, a little bit of keys, a little bit of guitar. Uh, just enough to take through sound check. Okay, so there will be times when you'll get behind a drum kit or guitar or bass keyboard and, and hammer out some music or, or notes or beats or what have you to, to yeah. make sure it's... Yeah, I just ask what chords we're playing and you just, just strum along. There's nothing... Just to get a sound. Right, like, right. You know. Now, is that nerve-wracking at all? At first it was. I, I know for me, like, I've heard comedians do routines on this. You know, like going into Sam Ash and you want to test the guitar and all these really good musicians are looking at you. Like I would <laughs> never, like I, they were like, you want to plug it into an amp? And I'd say, no, but, but sir, you want to buy an amp. But I don't want to play through an amp in front of all the people in this store. I, 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 I understand that. And, uh, when I first started, I, I, I would have never thought of that, trying to do that. But uh, you know, when, when you're young and you, you, you start off in the industry as a musician, you want to, like, progress. And then right, sometimes, right. sometimes there is a problem with guys who want to be musicians more than they wanted to be techs. All right, so then they're trying to showboat a little? Trying to showboat a little bit, yeah. I mean, there's that, a time that, place for everything. I would think that probably goes across really transparent and badly. Oh, yeah, some guys, you know... It depends. You know, certain artists are like, you know what? I don't want to see that guy anymore. Yeah. I mean, if I was in that role, it's like, that's, that's not what you're doing. That's not what you're here for. Right. You know, it's very self-indulgent. When, when the, You know, if, if I've gotten nothing else from the 20 or so shows we've done so far, and I think Guitar Tells has done about 20 so far, it, is that it, it's if it's about you, you will not succeed. Right. If it's about making the audience happy, you will. The audience and the people around you happy. Right, right. So I would imagine if you've got a tech who's trying to show much better musicians that he or she is pretty damn good, it's not going to be received very well. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I feel like sometimes I'm a little hard on those guys, but uh, I feel like it, it's a, it has to be a give and take thing, and it's, it's a working environment. It needs to be almost like a family. Right. There. I treat it like the Marines. It's about the guy standing next to you. Right. Because when you're out there, it's, it's not even about the country at that point. It's about the guy standing next to you. Right, right. You know? So, I mean, I, it's not, I think that's carried me throughout this whole thing. 
Uh, yeah, we had um, Mike McGagey on recently, and he was saying his job is to make the people around him look good. Oh, yeah. Like, that's, that's his job. Yeah. That even applies even more to me. Right, right, right. Where you're not, you're not playing with the band, um, but at the same time, you're, that's exclusively your job. But even for the musicians vis-a-vis -vis each other, and you are a musician, but the, the performing musicians, uh, you know, the best of the best are saying, I'm here to support the people I'm playing with. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So let, let's go back in time a little bit. So um, were you a musician before you became a tech? Oh, yeah. So that was, so that was your main So, so let's start, let's start in high school. Did, or when did you start drums? Let me ask it that way. Actually when I was 10. Really? Yeah. So, so let, let me ask you if you can put humility aside for a second. I got, I got the sense uh, from our little jam session that you're a very good drummer. Are you like a studio musician level of, of drummer? Do you think if you were to put humility aside? I, I would have to say I'm close, but I'm not there at, okay. this, at this point in the game. At one point, I have to say in the 90s, there was okay. so much work of all around that uh, we were all, there's guys that weren't even like studio musicians that were playing in studios and stuff like that. So but have I, you done that? Oh, yeah. Back in the 90s, it was, it was fruitful. It was commercials, uh, studio album recordings. Occasionally, there's there's some studios in Pennsylvania now that uh, I was doing some recordings in, and I occasionally get once in a blue moon call to do uh, uh, recordings. And I've set up my studio now so I can do tracks from home and people can right, sit right. And like do that. I haven't gone up to that point yet, but um, I'm working at it. So. Um... So what have you been on albums we might have, most people might have heard of? Oh, you know? no, probably not. Okay. <laughs> probably right. not. It's just like a lot of local artists that are like sing and, and, and play guitar, and play keyboards and stuff like that. But that's great. The fact that you, so you, so in the nineties, you're getting called in if you get like a fresh band and, or let's say like a songwriter who needs a drummer for their session band, something like that, you get called in and you would get, uh, commercial work on commercials, right? Yeah. Because people forget. I mean, everything we get on social media has music. Right. Whether it's the old days where it was television or movies to now just, you know, YouTube or what have you. Right. There's always some kind of music playing around. Oh, yeah. In the background. Oh, yeah. People f forget that, like, it's, it's all around you. Yeah. You know? Even when people are watching movies, I... I, I I remember watching some of the movies that I've played on, and I'm just like, wow. I'm just like, <laughs> I remember that session. Wait, what movies have you played on? Uh, there was a, uh, oh my God, there was one of Robert De Niro film, Ed Norton. Uh, I have to. Oh, I, have to I know that it. movie. I think. Wait. The score. Yeah. The score. There was literally, there was literally uh, eight percussionists on that, on that session. And it was. Right. It was a magic moment. It was like a, a week and a half of recording, a lot of oh, wow. a lot of tracks. It was it was it was in a big big like theater, like in Manhattan, and all of us. And I was I was all I was doing is playing these frames. <laughs> what is now? What is by a frame? What do you mean? Like literally, like like, like a triangle? No, like these like uh, you know like you know shelving units. Okay. Like, uh, you you were you were. Uh, nail into the wall, right? Actually playing these rails. Just, oh wow! Yeah, just playing like a triplet feel on those. Uh, while uh, it was it was nuts. It oh, was, that's pretty cool. That's oh, actually yeah. really cool. Yeah, it was it it really opened my mind to like how percussion can be. It could be on anything, right? Anything, anything it could be just so like you know. There, there. I went to a school in Washington, and. Uh, we talked on our last, our second to last show about Washington go-go music. Are you familiar with it? Oh yeah, the go-go beats. Oh yeah, infamous. Right. Go -go. So do you remember the uh, junkyard band? Did, did you ever oh, see yeah. that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I've yeah. seen them live on street corner. Like I saw them on street corners before they were famous, and they would play like garbage pails and paint cans and That's things right. like that. That's right. They were. So so you're 
music. Our, yeah, so this is our second time talking about go go music. It sort of came parallel to hip hop, and then hip hop. Oh, absolutely. Really yes. And then go go did it. You know, Big Old Butt is sort of a go go ish song, but not really. Oh, right? Right. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you could totally see it. You right, totally right. Make a reference to that. Well, we talked to Chuck Brown. Chuck Brown, that's right. He was huge. And uh, my favorite, um, Let's Get Small. Who did Let's Get Small? Um, I can't remember. I, no, I can't that. either. But, but uh, what I loved, and this is so great for not just a drummer, but a percussionist like you, we would be at some outdoor event. And when they start playing, I don't dance, nor can I. And it's a, it's a bad thing to see if I try. Um, but when they start playing, when Go-Go kicks in, you can't help it. Oh, yeah. Like, unlike any music I'm familiar with, at least for me, when, when all those percussion instruments kick in, there, there is something about that beat in Go-Go music. Oh, I've, it's, 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 the, uh, it's the upbeat on the uh, second, second kick drum that just kicks it over. It's, it's, you know, they all start the same, like, and then, boom, I can't do it. But, yeah. it was, it's so moving. It just yeah. pushes you forward, and it just makes the music uh, just make you, makes you jump. Right. You know, done right, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great. And, uh, I, and I guess the reason why it didn't stay any longer is that it then becomes repetitive, and I guess it doesn't, it doesn't go maybe as far as people want it to, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not expressing it well, but it's one thing. And right. maybe that's why it didn't fully take off. I don't think it was able to get like three dimensionality about it. Well, I mean, I don't these, know. these days it's, it's about EDM music and all that kind of stuff anyway, which is pretty mindless and it's just repetitive. Yeah. The whole thing. You could say the same thing about that, but it was just the backing of it. Uh, go go music was such a, I hate to use the word for you know lack of a word, but it was so ghetto that yeah. it didn't have that and uh, it was very real. I mean, like I saw it first time. It, it was so raw. Yes, was, and that was that's what the best part of that was. It was so um, natural and 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 lively that I think it, it took too much for people to think about. Yeah, maybe that's it. You know, we'd be drunk 2 a.m. walking around, and you suddenly around the corner, you'd see a bunch of kids, young adults, and old adults, maybe 10, 15 people just banging on whatever they had in front of them with rhythms that were beyond that standard. Right. In that, in that sense, it's really about, about the music. It's kind of like all the uh, guys down in New Orleans. Right. Who play, you know, uh, that New Orleans uh, street beats and, and oh my god, and it's 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 exactly like that because I will be there in 17 days. Oh, nice! Yeah, it's it's magical. Music it is a magical place. It's yeah, I, I saw the Tipitinas. Um, I saw Aaron Neville. Oh, nice! And okay. and I was you know, again. I was there was a little bit of alcohol in me, and I literally <laughs> just had. Tears coming out of my eyes when, when he hits those notes in New Orleans. Oh, yeah. It's the authenticity and the realness. And then hearing that that music where it belongs. It's like seeing Bruce in New Jersey. Oh yeah. You know. Oh, absolutely. I have to say, like, I, I did a short run with the meters. And okay. that was that was some of the most magical moments. The music So I mean it's original meters, you know, with uh, George Porter, um, you know, Zigaboo, and, you know, Aaron, uh, Art, all those guys. It's, it was such a, you realize the history behind that, all that music yes. that comes from, and where all these guys are trying, trying to cop all those licks and everything. You, you see it. Yeah. You just feel kind of fortunate about it. Uh, so it's, it's, I feel blessed. Uh, it's, it's fine, yeah. And, and it's funny, I'll, I'll throw you a little compliment. Uh, when we were doing bad, and I'm I'm just sitting on my amp, and again I'm being almost more of an observer than a participant. I was thinking I'm feeling very blessed right now that I'm getting enveloped by this wall of music that I have a little bit of involvement in, because that that moment 
was really, you know, there's a tape of it somewhere. I think someone was recording. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that you felt what I felt in that. Um, because, it, and that's, that's the beauty of music, is sometimes you can feel this, this sort of wall of, of, of something envelop you. And it, right. takes you, it takes you to a different place. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost like the, the drums are playing me. I don't necessarily have to play the drums. It just right. it flows correctly. If it flows great, that's, that's, that's your moment. And that's interesting. What I did not at all perceive is that, but it makes sense now. You're sitting there doing your regular percussion that you've been doing the last 30, 40 minutes that we've been playing. And then something, you heard something from that guitar player. Um, and then you just shuffled on over 10 feet or whatever it was to the drum kit. And I guess that is, you got inspired by hearing what he was doing. Oh, yeah. It informed what you did. But it, it really, it, it came out really nice. No, oh, yeah, it did. I have to say that was, that was the best moment of that, that jam. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. Uh, so, so from a musical point of view, so what are you, what do you do to occupy your time these days in, in the middle of COVID? I know you guys jam every week, right? You guys go to, we're at a farm, right? It's, are you part of that weekly jam? I, I, I can be. Uh, unfortunately, I have, fortunately, I've, after COVID and stuff like that, I, I, I've been not, I've been le less busy with work, but catching up on a lot of housework. And actually, I've, I've taken this time to kind of like reanalyze my playing and go back to like sourcing myself and finding uh, the organic part of myself to play and make sure that I still have those chops. I still have the feel. I still have ideas that I can lay down. So I go to GarageBand, I lay down some tracks, and I just go over it with some bass lines. So I try and reinvent myself and I try and get a feeling again of it. So I, I don't lose that aspect of it because it, it's, a, it's part of what I do. So that's really cool. So we had uh, Alex Scooby on our show, one of our earliest Zoom shows. So when, when COVID first hit, uh, he's an actor, but we sort of the, the technical link is he was in a guitar band in New Jersey before he became a very successful actor on CSI and things like that, like really successful. Um, but he said the same exact thing about acting that you just said about musicianship on our show, which is that COVID sucks, COVID is horrible, and, and most horrifically people are dying. So I, you know, so we, we, we all have different experiences regard to it and, and people are socially struggling uh, but a lot of people in, in the midst of just something that's historically unprecedented at least in our lives and maybe ever not ever because it's happened before but in our lives is that they're trying to use this as an opportunity to find meaning they're trying to use this as an opportunity to artistically grow and, and you said it just like Alex <laughs> you know that, that, that he's using this you know and they're doing a lot of creative acting things and just writing and, and things like that. But uh, when people are, are stuck in their homes, I mean, I barely exit my home. I, I, you know, I, literally, like I went, I right. saw you guys. I, I, I barely know how to wear a mask because I'm almost never out of my house. Right on. And I, I get my groceries in my trunk and things like that. I very rarely leave. Um, but in any event, so people are using this artistically as an opportunity to emerge from this better. I think it's really cool. So I'm, I'm thrilled you're doing it. I'm not thrilled this is happening, but it's, it's the way to make the best of something, right? It is. Is you have you have to take your time and uh, apply it and use it wisely uh, and grow as a musician. Because these, if you're not doing anything else, it's the only thing you, you can do. Uh, right. it, it comes from uh, doing what you love. If you if you truly, honestly love what you do. It's not work. It, it, right. You only move forward. And right. uh, movement is life. So if you move forward, you know, you're only growing. So that's how I always feel. It's very true. It's very true. I, you know, again, when I started as a lawyer, um, I was speaking with an elder statesman who was a lawyer, my old boss's 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 boss kind of thing. And he equated us with being like sharks. If you stop swimming, you can't breathe. And, <laughs> right. Uh, and I was very offended by that line because I thought, what about the people who just sort of 
They're sort of quiet in their own little corner, um, and they just do what they do, and they do it until they retire. Then they have their retirement, and they live until they don't live anymore. And as I look back now, he was right, and my perception was as wrong as wrong could be. If you, if you keep moving, you keep growing, you keep breathing and developing, and things like that. So he, he was very much right. And uh, I was a young kid who just thought he was a stupid old, I was a stupid old man, but I thought it was a little brash of him to say. And he was, he was, I'm, sure, he was right. I'm sure it was the way he was saying it, too. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that criticism was accurate. Yeah. Sometimes it's about the delivery. You know what? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that. Uh, I had a visceral reaction to the way he said it because the context was uh, sort of, I'm better than the person I'm currently comparing myself to who is important to you, Dave. You oh, know? I know. That was, I was referring to an earlier mentor of mine. So right. that's, that's why I had the visceral reaction. Right, 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 right. Sometimes a self aggrandizing <laughs> statement. Right, right. That's, you know, uh, some guys I know that I, I've worked under just think they know it all. And they just think it's like, well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done the whole thing. Uh, I, I always go into a new job completely knowing nothing. And I say to myself, I don't know anything about this gig. Even on a tour, I say if I go back out on Steely Dan, Right. I, I say to myself, like, I have, I have no idea how this is going to play out. Because in truth, the artist, like Donald, won't know what he's going to do until he shows up to rehearsal. Right. So, I mean, it might, be, it might be the same old songs as we always do, but if we're going to do it differently, something might be different. So, I, you know, you have to kind of keep an open mind. Yeah, that's true. And, and I like the fact that you're approaching it with both an open mind and humility, you know, and then as you get deeper in, certainly your confidence in being good at what you do in your life experience. But if you start from that position of an open mind and open heart and humility, you will then have an opportunity to grow in that new game. Right, right. And if you didn't, you wouldn't. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, an artist told me once, you're only as good as the guy, the next guy that comes along. Right, yeah. So, right, because there's always people nipping at your heels. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's always, if you're on top, there's just one more reason for someone to try to knock you off. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, that's, that's why I like working with people who just want to work together and just get through the day. Yeah, and, and again, it makes your day-to-day -day experience, if you're going on a, I don't know, 32-day tour, how much nicer is it if you all enjoy each other? Right, right. Then if you, if you hate each other but do a great job, <laughs> you know, which can happen, I suppose. Good. Yes, it could. You know? It could. I have to say, this one, this tour I did two years ago was, do you know Ry Cooter? Name he's sounds singer, familiar. He's a singer-songwriter, very, very eclectic, very American folky. Yeah, he's, 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 sounds he's, familiar. Yeah, he's a he's a guitar supposedly god, and I have to say, he's, wait, he's, wait, so let me cut you off. So based upon the fact that I host a show called Guitar Tales, and I'm not familiar with him, <laughs> <laughs> but I will fest to it. I will fest to it. No, I'm not familiar. I, the name sounds familiar. That's the most I will admit to. He's more. So he's I just more. lost all my credibility with the people <laughs> you know who might watch this, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Rai, Rai, Rai is not that known as a uh, guitar player, but I mean, he is like the quintessential. If you ask some of a lot of the top guys, like Rai was the old, and the, the stuff he owns is pretty, pretty, pretty old. Oh, and, right. Yeah. Like, antiquated stuff. He uses like four amps at the same time. It's really like, he really makes this wall of sound thing. But uh, <laughs> I digress. One of the guys, his tech, I have to say, at one point in time, was like the worst guy to be around. Right. Like Mr. Know It All, and it was it was a rough it was a rough time. But we all, you know, that being said, we all got through it. You know, yeah. but the rest of us pulled together and we we got through it, just despite his like yeah yeah you know problems yeah. or what have you. So 
it, that, that's it, tough. It, it is. So you, you just made me think. So so there's a whole thing. We could do two hours on, on stuff. Like, I love to talk about amps. You know, like, you probably dealt with, like, temperamental Leslie cabinets. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine what it would be like to try to maintain those. Oh, yeah. It's it's hard. It's hard, especially on the road, because you're not really, like, you don't have the real resources on site to, like, if the motor blows on oh my the God. Leslie, yeah, it's like okay, I could, I could, I could put in the spare, but if that spare goes, I have nothing. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know. So there's there's always moments like that. Uh, uh, I I used to be the uh, B3 keyboard tech on uh, the Conan O'Brien show. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, they used to leave their Leslie running. Every, all night. Oh, really? They had a Leslie on his yeah, show? Under the under the under the bleachers. Wow. Back in the day. And I constantly tell them, like, I'll take your money. I'll come in. You you guys can pay me, but you guys would save a lot of money if you just turned off the Leslie at night. <laughs> I I just can't get over the fact that a TV show would be using a Leslie. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It just seems like I would just think they would have some kind of sample this or that, you know, and just have like a generic kind of like solid steady kind of whatever. I'm sure some some of the newer bands nowadays do, but on like Saturday Night Live, there's there's a full on like Leslie. Well, yeah, Leslie, like G.E. You know? e. Smith is some he's something else, remember? Oh yeah, totally. He's definitely. He he seemed. Did you ever work with him? Oh yeah, I was. He the, seemed like a was, mountain of ego. Oh, was he? Uh, this is me from afar, like just through a TV receiving. I can see, that. I can see where you're saying that, but I just think he's so wrapped up in his own thing. Okay. I don't necessarily think it's an ego thing. I just think he's just so like in his moment. Yeah, I saw a clip of him with Eddie Van Halen, and <laughs> I, I didn't sense enough sort of visual deference from him to Eddie. You know, thinking, you know, and he's amazing. G.E. Smith is unbelievable. I used to yeah. love watching him, you know, on guitar on that show. But when he's jamming with Eddie, he's looking at Eddie like, are we're two peers? And I think I'm, they probably were peers. Like, you know, Eddie does a lot of really cool stuff. But right. you know, G.E. Smith is every bit as good, just not as famous. Right. But, um, and maybe better in many regards. But there, there was something about the fact that not only was he not visually seemingly intimidated by the guy, they were just equally sharing the stage. And I thought, really? But he is that guy, <laughs> you know? But that was just my perception. Yeah, I, I was a uh, drum tech on Saturday Night Live uh, for a couple of years during, during the GE years. Yeah, he, but he was. He was, I mean, he's still around, right? Uh, actually, he's playing uh, bass on uh, Roger Waters. Oh, really? Oh, that new tour that they're doing now. Yeah, he's well. Yeah, well, when it when it was out. Oh, right, right. Now they're not right. He yeah. was definitely he was the musical director slash uh, bass player. Oh, okay. On that tour, which is ironic since he's been known for his guitar playing. I know, but yeah, it's a lot of guitar players segue over, and I'm sure that's much to the chagrin of people take bass extremely seriously. Oh, yeah. Because it's, you know, a guitar player getting by on bass is so different than a bass player really playing bass, you know. I mean, when I, when I, I had a, a band when I was in law school, and um, our bass player was a thousand times the guitar player I was, so we had a deal. If, <laughs> if there was ever anything difficult, I would slide over to bass, right. and he would, like, we played one way out. I couldn't play right on. lead. I don't, I don't even play lead. So I would do the bump, 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 and up. I would do that on bass. Right, right. And he would do the searing lead, you know, because so, but I would do the bullshit version of bass. As opposed right to on. Sure, sure, sure. Player. So, so we, this, I, I'm, this has been so much fun. I, I just looked at the clock. I feel like it's been two minutes. <laughs> and um, I, I, I would love, someday I would love to get you back on and talk about equipment. Can we do that sometime? Yeah, no problem. Anytime you want. I would. 
we could have so much fun on that because like, I, I, I could yeah. do like a 40 minute Sean Leslie cabinets, you know, <laughs> you know. Or amps, 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 I'm, I'm pretty diverse on the amps. That oh, I bet you are. Like, yeah. well, let me, one last thing before we go. I've been bastardizing the um, Mesa Boogie amp origin story. Do you know it? Mesa Boogie, how they created it? The whole thing where they like trick someone and put like a big amp into a little Princeton and their Princeton amp. Do you know that story? Oh, I think it was based on the Mark IV, that Mesa Boogie Mark IV amp, that, that small little like 12-inch yeah. amp. Yeah, like they tricked yeah. someone as like a good gag. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've been bastardizing the story on the show all the time. I know it's something like that where they put like a really big beefy amp into a, like a little Fender backstage or a little Princeton amp or something, or Fender Champ or something, right? But, I, I, there was an interesting story. One last story. Uh, yeah. On one of the MTV Music Awards uh, on Aerosmith. Okay. I was working for a backline company, and we we lent a small little a deluxe reverb. Okay. Like, uh, a, fat, uh, like a twin sorry. reverb or just a regular? No, I'm sorry. A, um, uh, uh, a deluxe. Uh, uh, blues deluxe. Small okay. Blues deluxe. It's a... Uh, uh, it was like a uh, 212. Okay, so the, like sort of like a twin reverbish kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, right? twin reverbish thing. Right. And we put it up there behind this um, stack behind Joe Perry's rig. Okay. Wall, literally wall of boxes, cabinets. A whole bunch. So a bunch of, of like four, four, four by twelve box cabinets. Right. There's literally eight of them, and a whole wow. bunch of box heads, a Marshall head head and the one with his mic was the deluxe reverb in the back behind that was, oh. the that was fun but in radio city music hall it sounded like it was the entire rig oh that's so funny it so was, to the perception the, so the audience gets this perception he's doing huge the right, big right, marshall the, the classic marshall stack right <laughs> but and in like, reality it's a little, a little yeah, yeah exactly it was Hilarious. Oh, that's really funny. Well, what was, what do they say? It was, what was the little Princeton? Uh, or not the, it was the Fender, not the Twin Reed. What was the little, the Fender Champ, don't they say? Fender Champ, they, oh yeah. That, they say that was on more studio albums than almost any other amp, right? There's an avatar, there's a studio in uh, these uh, Power Station, which is Avatar, which is changed name. They have, they have three like Princeton Champs. And that, yeah. Those champs Champ are, amp was like the amp those, for studio those music. Amps were all all yeah. wild for a long time, and they have ended up on so many albums. Yeah, it, it's funny because I did a gig once with Elvis Costello. Oh, I love Elvis. It yes, for the it was for the uh, uh, hurricane that happened in New Orleans. Okay, uh, and he he ordered a. Um, uh, a, a deluxe reverb, a 65 old deluxe reverb. Uh, it was a big festival, so we didn't have one. Right. So, so is a deluxe uh, reverb different than the the, the twin? Or is oh it yeah, the same? it's totally different. So what's the totally twin, what's the deluxe reverb? Deluxe reverb is more of like a rocking amp. So is it a single 12 or is it a double? It's a, you can get it as a single or a double. Okay. Uh, this one this one that he wanted was a double. Uh, but there was there weren't any around because there was there was like a last minute show. Okay. So I I borrowed this uh this print this champ <laughs> and I brought it in and I says, Well, this is all I got. He's like, All right, well let's try it. And he played a Les Paul through it. Oh really? A gold top, a gold top through it. Plugged it in. And I says, For the show I'll get you the I'll get you the, the deluxe reverb. Okay? Right. And he says, Okay, no problem. And then he played it, and then after the rehearsal, he says, you know what? We're just going to stick with the sound, and I just love this little amp. Let's just take it with us. Of course, I couldn't tell anybody that I was taking it. Right. It ended up on the show. So then wow. the, show, the last show at Madison Square Garden, going to this little, little Princeton champ. Wow. Now, is the, is the champ, that's a two. You probably got a two. Oh, yeah. Right? It was a two yeah. amp. Oh, yeah. It was one of the original ones. Oh, so this is like a 60-something. Oh, yeah. This was like a 62. Wow. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the tweed was coming off. The side but, was all ripped up. It was, it, was, 
it was brutal. But, but I'm sure the speaker was newer, right? You, you can't have the original speaker in that, right? Uh, this was replaced. It was yeah. one of the Les John's speakers, but and, but the the original uh, guts of it was still. That's cool. And they're gonna have and the reverb is the spring tank. It's the yes, charge. that's right. Because it did. So you hit it, you yeah. go. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You definitely. I wouldn't let anybody walk next to it because they would. You would hear it as you. Oh, it's horrible that noise. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's oh, pretty cool. cool. Oh, yeah. oh, we got it. We got to come back and do a tech show, a pure tech show. <laughs> well, this is so much fun. I want to thank you for joining us on Guitar Tales. Uh, we've had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Dave. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Well, listen, everyone. Uh, take care. I want you to have a good night. Everyone, be safe, and we will be back very soon with more Guitar Tales shows. Have a good night. All right. So we uh, let's see. We're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I did last time. We had it was like a fake outtake. It was okay. an unintended outtake. Nice. Um, so we're still recording here. I screwed it up again. This is what happens when I run the board. All right. So I'm going to hang up on you. Okay. Right? Cool. Thanks, right. Dave. Thanks Thank again. you. Have a good night. All right, bye -bye. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye.